Morning. <coughs> if you're able, please stand. We're going to sing River of Life. Mac Powell. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. If you've been searching, carrying burdens, if you've been lost and looking for a home, if you've been Something is missing You should know that You are not Thank you. 
Our next song is Down to the River to Pray. And I know one person here that loves this song. Miss Linda, this is for you.
Sunday. Listen, next Sunday, maybe, maybe not, there's going to be some money taped under the chairs over here. <laughs> we rearrange a little bit and we still lean this way but that's okay because look how full you are <laughs> yeah maybe maybe not money under the chairs next week on this side <laughs> thank you I'm sorry what yeah. <laughs> yes up front and on this side <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday, and I'm just so glad that we could all come and be together this morning. But um, as we do come together, let's go to the Lord in prayer, invite him into our service, and ask his blessings on our offering this day. God, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've provided. And God, we thank you for this beautiful place that you've provided for us. And now as we begin our time together, God, we just invite you to be a part of it, Father. We just ask that the things that we say and do and sing this morning would just be a blessing to you. God, that the things that we say and do this morning would honor you and just, just thrill your heart, God. That's our goal this morning is to praise you and lift you up this morning. And God, we ask that for the surrounding churches who are preaching the gospel this morning, that you would be among them as well. And God, now we just offer this time to you. God, we're in a time of giving, in a time of giving to your church. And we pray now, God, that you would bless those who have to give. And God, we ask your blessing on those who may not have to give. But God, all that we receive, we give to you. We pray that you would help us to steward well as we work to serve you and your people in this community. God, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you bless this time, and we ask that you bless this offering. For it's in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good, good, good. Okay, I'm going to start off this morning with a Bible verse, which is going to be our, what we're going to talk about today. And the scripture comes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And it says, this is love. 
It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. I have in my pocket, I'm going to sit down now, I have three dollars, okay? I have a gold coin, no, I have a gold coin, I have a silver coin, and I have a paper dollar. Now, this is the one that y'all are used to using. This is a paper dollar. This is what we call a Sacagawea gold coin. It's got the Indian Sacagawea's picture on it. And it's got, this one is a Susan B. Anthony dollar. And I have three dollars, right? Okay, so which one of these do you think has the most value? The gold one? The paper one? You know what? I have three dollars. They are all worth the very same. They have the very same value. This you can pay for at the store as a dollar. This you can pay at the store with as a dollar. And this one you can pay at the store for a dollar. But they all look different, don't they? And I think Rhett picked out the gold one because we think gold would be worth more. But just because they look different, they all have the same value. They are all dollar coins. Okay? So now let's, let's look at what we got up here today. Are we all the same? No. We don't look the same. We got boys. We got girls. We got blonde hair. We got brown hair. We got blue eyes. We probably got brown eyes. We got short. We got tall. We got all kinds of different people up here, and we got all kinds of different people in this room, don't we, that look different, just like these gold coins. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it would. See, God knew that. God made each one of us different. Yes, sir. Right. And see, I had the fear this morning that I would be talking about how we all look different, and I would have the set of identical twins up here this morning. So that that kind of that crept into me this morning. But I was prepared for that. Okay, but people are like that too. And you know what? God looks at all of us as different. He made us all different. And we are all the same in God's eyes. Did you know that? We, are, we all have the same value. Let me say that. Not a person in here is worth more to God than another person in here. Let me repeat that. I want you to repeat it after me. I'm going to say it, and then I want you to say it. We are all have the same value to God. We all have the same value to God. And I cannot stress that enough. He loves us all the same. And you know what? He loves us all the same no matter what. No matter what we look like, no matter what we've done, we all have the same value to God, and he loves us all the same. Yes. There are people out there that have the same name, but they look different. So we can tell them apart. But we are all have the same value to God. He loves each and every one of us the same no matter what. And that's what I want you guys to remember today. Just like these $3 coins that look different, they all have the same value. Everybody in this room looks different, but well, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so, but what I want to say is that that makes me feel really good. Like our Bible verse says, this is love. That God sent his son Jesus to take the place of our sin. And that makes me feel pretty valuable to God. Will you pray with me this morning? Okay. Dear Father, we are thankful that though we are all different, you will always love us all the same. Amen.
Good morning, church. Sandy, hang on to that $3. We might buy a candy bar on the way home with it. <laughs> but I'll know if you give the cashiers a silver dollar and a gold dollar, that might mix them up a little bit. So uh, hope everyone's doing well. So good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, just a, a, one or two announcements very quickly. I do want to say a big thanks to everyone who participated in our candy crawl uh, Thursday night. We had a really, really great time, a uh, good turnout. I had 445 folks come through the door. As you see in the bulletin there, it says we had 15 stations and 25 plus volunteers. And we just always have a whole lot of fun and we're just so thankful for everybody's help and participation. Thank you so much. That's all I have. And Bill, I'm gonna let you turn it over. And it's first of the month and you do your thing. All right. Thank you, Terry. Good morning, church. Boy, these months seem to fly by, don't they? <laughs> okay, Ever, any, all of you born in November, would you please stand up so we can all sing happy birthday to you? Oh, man, we got a lot of them this morning. Great. Let's all sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right, thank you, Bill. So if we can, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful fall day that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. Your majesty and glory is just shown evident by the colors in the trees and just the beauty of the world that you've provided for us. Lord, be with us and all those who are in need of your healing today. Bless them, help your healing hands to be laid upon them, Lord. Help the needs that they have to be met and just walk with and care for their families and loved ones who take care of them each and every day. Lord, please be with our country this week. We just ask for your guidance and your direction in the things that will be happening. We just ask for your love to come into this country and to just unite us and to make us as one as you would have us to be. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Walk with us. Keep us safe and protected in all that we do. Help us to be the servants that you would have us to be, Lord. And we're so thankful for all the many, many blessings that have been bestowed upon us all. You loved us way more than we could ever be, in, be worthy of. And we just ask that we can be the servants and do your will each and every day. So now let's join together in the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah, it is a little longer walk. <laughs> it is, it is. Oh, goodness. Well, good morning again. Oh, goodness. Last week, we talked about honor. This week, we're going to talk about something a little different, another forgotten virtue. But before we do, I was reminded of a cartoon, and some of you may remember it, that said, the wife, there's a wife in the cartoon, and she says, sometimes I wake up grumpy, and sometimes I let him sleep in. <laughs> and then there's another one where this pastor and his wife are deep in conversation, and the wife says, let's do something different today. How about, you, how about you be charming at home and grumpy at church? 
<laughs> but now that, that really doesn't apply to me because I can be grumpy in both places. <laughs> but some of you may not know that. You may not know that I can be grumpy in both places because there are times when we just hide ourselves, right? We, we use masks. And some of us have learned to do that in such a way that we don't really see what's taking place on the inside. We can con our coworkers. We can fool our family and friends. We can play charades at church. And we can even deceive ourselves. But we can't masquerade before the Lord because he sees right behind the mask. Most people do a pretty good job of mask management. And I will confess to you today that I make mistakes on a regular basis, just as Lauren and Kimberly. <laughs> At times, my wisdom is a little suspect, and my heart is often unholy. But today, we're going to talk about the forgotten virtue of purity. And many of us tend to create sometimes our own definition of purity, so we're going to be scripture heavy in today's message because it's so important that we understand what the Bible actually says about purity. Now, Lauren worked really, really hard on the program this week to get all those scripture references listed. And when she showed it to me, I opened it up and I said, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to have to take those scripture references out because when the folks come in and get their bulletin and open it up, they're going to turn around and leave before we get started. So you, you could just hang on and we'll, we'll go through them together. They're just not listed. Um, but in addition to scripture, I'm also going to share some thoughts of a few folks who are way smarter than I am. And so there is a lot to unpack in this forgotten virtue of purity today. And so I've tried to give you some helps with your bulletin insert, but don't be afraid even though it's two-sided. <laughs> so hang on, here we go. The bottom line is that the Lord can see our hearts. And when our hearts are pure, we can see God. That's what the sixth beatitude teaches in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see God. And I also like the message paraphrase that reads, You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. The emphasis here is on the inside. The term pure is the Greek word from where we get the word catharsis, which means a cleansing of emotions and our mind. Scholars suggest that there's actually two meanings uh, for the word pure. First, it means to make pure, to cleanse from dirt, filth, and contamination, and it was most often used to describe metals that had been refined by fire until they were free from impurities. And then the second definition refers to unmixed as having no double allegiance. In his commentary on this passage, Warren Wiersbe writes that the basic idea is that of integrity, singleness of heart, as opposed to duplicity or a divided heart. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus wants us to be single-minded in the depth of our being. James 1.8 teaches that the double-minded person is unstable in all they do. So now let's put these two definitions together. A person with a passion for purity is one who has been cleansed in character so that the way he or she looks in public, they look that same way in private. The one who is single-minded in his or her commitment to Christ 
will also be inwardly pure. We see this in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, which read, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now let's take a quick look at five kinds of purity that are taught in the Bible. The first one is divine purity. Isaiah 6, 3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is the holiness that only belongs to God and is intrinsic in his nature. And then we have created purity. Genesis 1, 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So when God first created the world, everything was pure. Okay, And then we move on to positional purity. This is the moment that we're saved. The moment we become a Christ follower. And the purity of Jesus is imputed to us. And God sees us as robed with righteousness in Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then there's practical purity, which is the one that gets a little tricky for us. It's the challenging part, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's at the point where we must live out our position in practical ways and our position in relation to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. And then there's ultimate purity. Because there is a day coming when Christians will be totally cleansed and purified. 1 John 3, 2, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All right, now let's go back to our beatitude right quick. If Jesus just would have said, blessed are the pure, for they will see God, instead of blessed are the pure of heart, then all those leaders back in Jesus' day would have been thrilled with that because they were, their goal was to make sure that their outside was perfect, right? They had all sorts of rules on <clears throat> what to eat, what to wear, how far you could walk on the Sabbath, and so on. They spent all their time trying to make the outside look good, but they were really masking what was on the inside. Actually, we can never fix what's on the inside by just trying to clean up some activity or change a habit. Jesus reserved some of his harshest words for those involved in this religious mass, ma mass management. Matthew 23, 20, uh, chapter 23, verses 25 and 20 through 28 reads like this. Woe to you. Now, let me give you a little hint. If you ever start a scripture, find a scripture that starts, woe to you, it's most likely not going to be pleasant. So Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and the, inside, and the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, 
On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Ouch. Those are strong words from Jesus. But these guys, these Pharisees, they mistakenly thought that their religious acts made them pure. But it really was just a show. Jesus saw through all of their prettiness and their pretense, and he looked right into their hearts as he quoted from Isaiah as found in Matthew 15, 8, which reads, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Holiness must come from the heart. Because everything we say and do, according to scripture, comes from the heart. Proverbs 4.23 provides this challenge to those of us who may be prone to pretend. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The heart represents the invisible innermost being as that which shapes our lives. Jesus is not interested in reforming our manners or changing um, the way we look on the outside. He is interested in changing the hearts of sinners like me, like you. I heard Pastor Greg Laurie say not long ago that people today choke on the word sinner. But it just is what it is. Purity cannot come from cleaning up our conduct or even from the result of rigorous rule keeping. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 18 and 19. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from their heart and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. God does not pay attention to the way that we look on the outside. God looks past that and even how we behave because he hones in on our hearts. 1 Samuel 16.7 says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then in Proverbs 21, 2, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. God longs to locate people with undivided hearts. Second Chronicles 16, 9. I told you it was scripture heavy today. Stay with me. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. To strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Notice here that he is not looking for believers who are busy in ministry. Or for those who are focused on the externals. He is searching for those sold out followers. Who have fully committed their hearts to him. When King David prayed for his son Solomon. In 1 Chronicles 29, 19, his request was for God to give Solomon wholehearted devotion to keep God's command. This is the way King David prayed for his son. But then on the other hand, in 2 Chronicles 12, 14, it was said of King Rehoboam that he did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. In the Bible, the heart represents the deepest emotions and also our mind and will. It's a comprehensive term that refers to the whole person. Proverbs 23, 7 teaches that what's on the inside of us determines who we really are. It reads, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. And then Proverbs 27, 19 says something very similar. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. 
So what is the problem of the heart? Billy Graham once said, we're suffering from only one disease in the world. He says, our basic problem is not a race problem. Our basic problem is not a poverty problem. Our basic problem is not a war problem. He goes on to say that our basic problem is a heart problem. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 reads, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. These are, these are hard words to hear. Who really knows how bad it is? But I know the Lord, I'm sorry, but I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due reward according to what their actions deserve. So let's talk about this deceitful heart. The word deceitful comes from the same root word that we get the name Jacob. Now, Jacob was a con artist and a deceiver until God got a hold of him and changed his name and changed his heart. And I like what the theologian Augustine said about the solution of living with a mask or living a sham. Augustine says, before God can deliver us from ourselves, we must undeceive ourselves. Jeremiah refers to our hearts as beyond cure because they are terminally diseased. G uh, Jeremiah cries out in chapter 15, verse 18 and says, why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? The reformers called this total depravity because it affects every part, of a, every part of us, every part of our life. What we think, how we feel, how we behave. But Adam, think about this, Adam, not my Adam, but the first Adam way back in the garden. Adam was in a perfect environment and he still sinned because sin comes from within. We only have to read the first six chapters in Genesis before coming to a statement about our insidious sinfulness. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And then we have the diagnosis of the heart. Because the heart, as we have just read, is deceitful and diseased, we desperately need God to show us and tell us what's wrong. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. God makes an intensive review of what's really inside of us. We can attempt to mask our hearts. We can hide it. But the thing is, it doesn't change it. We hide it, we mask it, but it still doesn't change. Because we cannot heal our own heart. We just don't have that skill set. But we do have the best physician. We do have the best doctor for the heart. In Jeremiah 17, 14, we hear the prophet call out, Hear me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. Now, I understand that this message sounds really harsh when we're talking about our heart. Because, you know, we, we believe that we try and make good decisions. We believe we have a good heart. And our intentions are so good. And that is an, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. But it's not what Scripture says, right? Scripture says something different about the heart. But the truth is, while we can't heal our own hearts, the truth is only the Holy One can heal our hearts. And we know that He wants to. We will never be pure in heart until God, this is the good part, gives us a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says... 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What a wonderful promise that is. So now let's, let's look at some practical ways that will help us in pursuit of purity. We've, scripture has told us kind of what's going on. So now let's look at some ways that we might do our part, right? But before we do, let me mention just a few ways that have been tried historically and are some are even still practiced today. The first one is legalism. This can be defined as a harsh set of rules of do's and don'ts, and you have to follow them to the letter in order to find favor with God and with others. This is exactly what the Pharisees tried to do. Um, and we talked about them earlier, and what did Jesus say to them? He said, woe to you. So this system doesn't work because it doesn't involve the heart. It doesn't deal with the heart. And then we have modernism, which is on the opposite end of the spectrum because so many people have thrown off the biblical standards and beliefs. This applies to the Sadducees, who rejected key doctrinal truths during the time of Jesus. They just picked and chose what worked for them. And this is still very popular today. We can pick and choose what works for us out of Scripture, and the things that we don't like or the things that don't work for us, we just ignore or just completely live out, uh, leave out. And then we've got activism. <clears throat> Some people believe that the only way to bring purity to the culture and to society is through political change. And we're right in the middle of it, right? While we certainly need to participate in the democratic process by voting, only a change of heart is going to change society. The zealots in Jesus' day of the first century believed that political change was needed and they were willing to do anything possible to make that happen. That sounds a little familiar today too. Okay, And then we have monasticism. Some individuals believe that you have to completely disengage from society in order to be pure. It, is that even possible, right? But the Essenes in Jesus' day practiced this withdrawal form in the, from the world, and it actually gained popularity about 150 B.C. But the problem here is is that sin lurks inside, and not, it's not just in the world, it lurks inside. So monasticism doesn't work either. So, if these methods don't work well in the promotion of purity, is there hope for holy living in our impure culture? Here's the thing that we need to remember. God always provides a way to do what he commands. He just doesn't tell you what to do and then leave you on your own. Just like some of you dads, when you're trying to teach your kids how to do something, you don't just say, go do, when they've never done, and just hope for the best. God doesn't work that way either. When he tells us that we need to do something, it's always for our own good, and he always gives us details in how to do it. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 gives us both God's part and our part. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We are to work out, not work for, okay? That's completely different. We are to work out our salvation, and God promises to work in us to act and to will according to his good purpose. The pursuit of purity is a joint venture. It's between us and God. 
we must participate in our sanctification or our purification as God works in us according to his good purpose. We do our part. He does his part. We can't sit back and do nothing, nor can we clean ourselves up on our own. We can't do it alone. But you see, as we do our part, God does his. He promises to do his. Scripture challenges us to keep our heart on the right path. And with that, the Bible gives us a number of paths, pathways to purity. And so we're going to run through these right quick. And as we do, I want you just to kind of ponder and see which ones would be helpful for you in your pursuit of purity. So the first one, admit our sinful impurity. The first step is to acknowledge that we cannot do it on our own because our sin in our humanness gets in our way. Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Have we ever admitted to God how unholy our heart can be? This is the first step in getting it made right. And then we ask God for a new heart. After admitting that we can't do it on our own and we agree with God's diagnosis, we ask him for a new one. This is what happens when we make a profession of faith. This is what happens at salvation. The Bible teaches that our hearts are purified through faith. So if we haven't, put our trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and to purify, purify our hearts, do we think it might be time to do so? And then we pray for purity. King David knew how impure his own heart was as he thought back through his moral mess-ups. After confessing to the Lord, he prayed for a pure heart in Psalm 51.10. David prayed for, said, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Again, when is the last time? I had to ask myself these questions. These, these messages that, that wear me out while I'm writing them, huh. And this was one of them, right? When was the last time we prayed for a pure heart? It's also helpful to follow another one of David's prayers found in Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there are any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Another pathway to purity, we draw close to God. When we come close to God, his very holiness will have a purifying effect in our lives. Proverbs 8:13, to fear or respect the Lord is to hate evil. And then James 4:8 says, come near to God, And he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There is no way that we could be pure without cultivating impact priorities in our our lives. Um, And impact is an acronym, but it can be very helpful for us as we're pursuing purity. Um, Instruction in God's word. Mobilizing for ministry, praying with faith, adoring God in worship, caring for one another, and telling others about the gospel. And then the fifth way to a pathway of purity, and some of you are much better at this than I am, and that is memorizing the word of God memorizing Bible verses. If we are serious about seeking purity in our life, one of the best ways to have victory in this is by memorizing scripture. 
in Psalm 119, 9 through 11, the psalmist asks a question in the first part of verse 9, and then he answers it for us. And it reads like this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then here's one that we're really going to love. Avoid grumbling and arguing. This one may surprise us, but when we grumble, it actually shows a lack of faith. And when we argue with others, we're allowing this unholiness to settle in our hearts. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Number seven, watch what we watch. It's always a good choice to steer clear of impure images because What comes through the eyes often settles in the heart. James 127 reads, Keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And the truth is, it matters what we look at. It matters whether it's a book or a magazine or TV or a movie or the internet. It matters. I have a friend who speaks up and down the East Coast, and for years and years, and you guys may have heard this before, she always says, garbage in, garbage out. Yep. And then we have waiting is wonderful. This is a pathway to purity. Rebecca St. James, who is a Christian musician, was, taught, was had a conversation with a radio host, and on this nationally syndicated re- show, they were talking about um, saving sex for marriage, right? And she, what Rebecca says is waiting is wonderful. Now, most think that this is outdated and it's unrealistic, right? Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed should be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all sexual, sexually immoral. But here's the good news. If you feel like it's too late, it's not. From this point on, with God's help and our determination, we can be as pure as we possibly can be this side of heaven. God is faithful to give us a do-over. We can start today, right? And then some of us might need to find different friends because of the influence they have in our lives. Proverbs 13, 12 encourages, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffer harms. So if we need some help in the area of purity... Maybe we find a friend who will help hold us accountable. And then here's the last one. We focus on our future hope. Again, if we are serious about pursuing purity, we'll quickly discover that this is a lifelong battle. But we don't despair and we don't bail out. We keep our eyes focused on what's to come for the believer. Longing for Christ's return will help purify our heart because we become what we love. 1 John 3.3 says, Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And then lastly, I know that this is a lot to digest, but the good news is the last part of that beatitude, which says, it's a promise, and it says, for they will see God. God reserves intimate fellowship with himself and to those who are unmixed in their devotion and unmasked in their relationship with him. We just have to be honest with the Lord. The closer we come to purity of heart, the more we trust God, the closer we get to God, the more pure we become. Author and theologian Phil Thigpen writes this. 
Unfortunately, sin has blinded us, leaving our spiritual eyes swollen shut. Unable to see God, we grope in the darkness, searching desperately for someone or something to make us happy. Our heart is splintered and scattered. We run to and fro, gathering first this trinket, then that one, dropping both for the next shiny one we spy. The result is a civil war in our soul. And all the while, our Father stands close by, waiting for us to turn around and run into his arms. If our vision of God is to grow wider and clearer and brighter, our will must be united as a single focus on him and an overriding desire to know and love him. So let me ask you, are we ready to see God like we've never seen before? Do we have an intense desire to know him better and better? If so, then maybe it's time to cut loose of some of that stuff that is keeping us from moving forward. When God looks into our life, what does he see? When God looks behind our mask, what does he discover? Is our heart undivided or are we blinded by our sin? Purity doesn't have to be a forgotten virtue. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Like every Sunday, the altar is always open or you are welcome to pray right where you are. But let me ask you. Where do you fall regarding purity? Is there something you need to give to God? Is there something you need to let go of? Maybe something you need to admit to. Or maybe you just need to draw closer to God. Maybe today is the day that you ask God for a new heart, as Scripture says, by giving him your old one through faith, as scripture says, as you enter into that personal relationship with him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you always provide a way for us to do what you command. Thank you for your word, Father, that it is our help and our guide. Since we have these promises found in your word, dear Lord, purify us from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for you. Father, these things in this world trip us up in our humanness, but thanks be to God. You give us a way to be made right. You made Jesus our Savior who has no sin. But became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Heal us, O oh Lord, and we will be healed. Save us and we will be saved. For you are the one we praise. Create in us, O oh God, a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Search us, O oh God, and know our heart. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in us and lead us in a way everlasting. Thank you, Father, that we can be made pure through faith through our faith in your Son and our Savior. Father, if there is one here today or watching online that needs a new heart, let today be the day, I pray, 
that they would ask you for that new heart by giving you their old heart through faith as they enter into that personal relationship with you. Let today be the day they pray this way. Dear Father, I give you my heart and ask for a new one through faith in your son Jesus. Forgive my sins, I pray. Help me. Make me new. Purify me, Father, I pray. Thank you, Lord Father. Help me to love you as you love me. And Father God, as we leave this place this day, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your presence. And God, we ask that you make us a blessing as we go. Make us a blessing to all that we, that we meet, all that you send our way. God, for every opportunity that you give us, help us to follow you in whatever way that may be, that we follow you through your strength and your guidance. Father, we have offered this time to you. We bless your holy, wonderful name. We offer and ask these things in the name of your Son and our Savior this day. Amen. Thank you for being here. I hope to see you next week. Invite somebody, bring them with you. And as always, if you prayed that believer's prayer today, I would love to talk with you and share next steps with you. Enjoy this beautiful Sunday.